post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. It's a potentially debilitating condition that can occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a natural disaster, a serious accident, a terrorist incident, or sudden death of a loved one, even war or violent personal assault. Now, in the case of police brutality incidents involving altercations between police and members of the community, this medical concern, often associated with veterans, is now considered by mental health professionals a major problem in urban communities, especially those where violence and aggressive policing are prevalent. Today, we welcome three guests from varied disciplines who all know something about the subject of post-traumatic stress disorder. Terry M. Williams is a public relations maven whose own personal struggles led her to author Black Pain about the silent crisis of mental health in the black community. Welcome. Kenton Kirby is a licensed social worker and the director of trauma support services for the Crown Heights Community Mediation Center. Welcome back, sir. We're always happy to have you here. And it's good to see Christopher Bilal back at the table. He is an outreach worker for Streetwise and Safe, an organization involved in social justice activism and civilian protection issues within the LGBTQ community in New York. Yeah, we're very happy to have you here. But before we get into our conversation, we want to start with a video that we shot just a little while ago. It's the story of a young man from Crown Heights who took the first step in getting himself together by asking for help. The shell that I usually go into is basically like a, like a safe house. Everything is all right in that shell, but it's also lonely in there. I used to get bullied a lot, and he used to call me Blackie because of my complexion. I was the quietest one inside of school, and yet I don't want to get picked on. I met John about a year and a half ago. Just kind of getting to know John, realizing that, you know, he's had a history of being targeted because of his skin color. Uh, the fact that his family live in poverty, you know, maybe he doesn't have the, the most expensive sneakers or the clothes. And he mentioned struggling, really struggling with people walking behind him. So imagine living in New York City with that being something that triggers you. I think that's part of the anxiety that came up in me, like, I really want to explode and just, you know, just take everybody in there that ever made fun of me. In the city of New York, statistics around kind of young men of color and incarceration is kind of glaring. So approximately 58% of young men of color between the ages of 19 and 24 are in city jails. So that right there shows that there are some serious systemic issues that are impacting the lives of these young men. The Make It Happen program uh, is a program directed at young men of color between the ages of 16 and 24 who've been directly impacted by community violence. And we discuss the intersections between uh, what healthy masculinity looks like for these young men and the history of trauma that they've dealt with. We run programming in some non-secure detention centers. We have researchers that work with us. We formed relationships with the Kings County District Attorney's Office. And every time I go to make it happen, you know, I always had to speak up, you know, talk to people. As I started to open up more and make it happen, I started doing it in school. It was out of my comfort zone at first, but after a while, I just started, you know, started getting used to it. It's like, oh, this is getting cool. I want our young men to challenge their definition of masculinity because a lot of times that definition is intertwined with their own trauma history. I was like, you know, like, like a worthless person. So Make It Happen was a big impact on me, trying to open up more and try to make friends a whole lot better. His history of being targeted and bullied and put him in this shell. Now he has a voice. He's starting to develop into an adult. And that's all I wanted for him. That's all he wanted for himself. I think it happened was the best thing for me, especially in my social life. Accountability is important for things that you do, but you can still hold someone accountable, but also validate their experience. I mean, that's a restorative approach to helping people. One thing I've noticed that helped me grow through all of the, the pain and obstacles in my life was that there were people out there that took an interest in me. When you feel safe and you feel validated, by validating being supported, you can do anything. 
you can you can really you can really move forward. Well, thank you for that amazing piece that uh, your organization did produce. Uh, you know, talking about moving forward, Kenton, uh, can you tell us how this young man's experience um, is indicative of how community uh, needs to come together in terms of dealing with um, police and community altercations? So, for example, this, this young man talked about how um, he's, he gets, he, he's triggered when some people come from behind him, right? Mm -hmm. That was due to his experiences of being targeted. Um, imagine having something else trigger you when, when it comes to trauma, right? Like if you're overexposed to violence in your community, maybe you hear a, a, a car backfire, but you're used to hearing gunfire, and you're assuming it's a, a gunshot or something. So these, these traumatic reactions that we're seeing out there, a lot of time are being misinterpreted and misread as uh, criminal behavior. Um, this extreme coping that uh, is going misrepresented in our community, in these black and brown communities, um, is really problematic. My experience. So, Terry, let's uh, shift the conversation a little bit and talk about people who seemingly have it all together. We see a young man who is you experiencing like it, <laughs> or any of us sitting at the table <laughs> or watching. But when you do learn how to negotiate and even get a measure of success, but these issues and even specifically the post traumatic stress doesn't evaporate just because you seem to be climbing the ladder so quickly so far. No, I, I think you're right about that. So many times we just, you know, we blinders and we don't really take the time to think about or process our emotions. And it's something that's really important to do. That's why I just, I really advocate people going to see a therapist mm -hmm. because it's not, it's, it's the childhood wounds and scars that have been passed on to us by our parents. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's what is. Mm -hmm. And we're impacted by those um, issues and oftentimes don't have the opportunity really to explore what that felt like. But if you're in a session with a psychologist and you start talking and all of a sudden the tears start to flow, mm -hmm. that's when you know that that was something that you never really addressed and need to in order to be your full, healthy self. Right. And why do, were you inspired to write a book then after walking through your own things? Mm, I think I spoke about it. Oh, I know what it was. I spoke about it, then somebody asked me to share my story in, in Essence Magazine, and like over 10,000 women responded wow. to it, and it made me realize that this was something that we needed to talk about, you know, because you look at people, just because somebody looks sane doesn't mean mm -hmm. that they have not um, been challenged with their childhood upbringing um, and never got help for it. That's the thing. So many of us don't recognize the importance of getting help. You think you don't need it, you get into that what do you call it, therapist's office, yeah. and you start talking, all of a sudden the tears the just... The gates open. Yeah. Well, there's also the, the stigma within our community and even getting people to admit that there's a problem. You know, how do you, how do you get people to recognize that they have a problem? I think about, I think that we talk about it. You know, I, I um, speak to young people all the time. You know, young people, they're smart as a whip. They already know we're crazy, so we can't, we can't hide it from them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They know. So we have to tell them. I talk about some things that have come out of my therapy sessions so that, so that people will understand this is what happens and this is how you can be your full self by talking about it and releasing the tears and the words or whatever. I actually want to bring Chris into the conversation. Now, Chris, you've had experience with uh, Stop It Frisk and you work with um, LGBTQ youth. You know, do you believe that community policing can work, and what are your clients saying? Um, I feel like all too often my clients and some of the folks who are LGBTQ, specifically queer and trans people of color, um, and folks who are perceived as Muslim, they say that under Bill Bratton's era of stop and frisk, broken windows policing, and community policing, um, a lot of those folks who have been stopped over 30 to 40, 50 times because of their sexual orientation or their gender, identity, they say um, they liken it. Many of those folks have escaped um, conflict zones in other countries, but, and they are immigrants and have immigration status and undocumented status. And they contend that um, neighborhood policing is very similar to insurgent-style policing that they have experienced in other conflict zones around the country. Um, and a lot of folks, specifically young folks um, from Crown Heights and Bed-Stuy and Brownsville, which have uh, NYPD paramilitary operations, 
and surveillance operations, they also kind of liken the experience to a war zone and an occupation and feel often targeted, like they use the language of being targeted consistently and repeatedly. So, so far, um, according to community members, we're not seeing a community policing as kind of being helpful. We're seeing it actually cause more trauma and cause more violence. You know, when you have more police encounters and more engagement with community, it leads, for example, to transgender people being misgendered. So often what happens when they come into contact with a transgender person, they'll ask for their ID and they won't respect the gender identity that's on that ID. And that can trigger childhood trauma that LGBT people have been dealing with. Um, and so some of the solutions that we've been talking to among some of our folks are restorative justice practices, are transformative justice practices. Um, and looking at models, models and like, you know, like truth and reconciliation um, practices that have taken place in South Africa during the apartheid crisis and seeing how can we actually get people, police officers and people who they have targeted and victimized and harassed and surveilled and get them to actually come together in a discourse and dialogue and talk about I know that the NYPD has a good intent, but we always talk about we want to make a distinction between intent versus impact and talk about the disparate impact of quality of life and broken women's policing on LGBT people, specifically black women and transgender women of color. So, okay. Kenton, looking at this through maybe that lens that he just introduced to say, we're treating people who have maybe have never left the four square miles yeah. of their Brooklyn home with conditions of post-traumatic stress disorder, how does looking at their experiences through that lens help to connect to a level of care where people can really make themselves whole again? So first I would say it's very important for us as clinical cl therapy provi providers of therapy to acknowledge that uh, the practice can actually be pretty oppressive in the sense of working with uh, black and brown, black and brown people in our communities. Um, and there's a lot of mistrust of our practice. So where we, we start from a place of you don't trust us, but you know what? We're gonna show and prove. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna literally come from a place of non judgment. You know, we're gonna acknowledge and validate your experiences out there. Uh, we don't use terms like non compliance in our programming. We talk about what happened? What's going on? Tell us more about that. And we lead with that as opposed to uh, from, from a more supportive and strength-based uh, perspective as opposed to a punitive uh, lens because so many, um, there's so many entities in, in, the, in the world that are punitive for our, for our population. So it's very important for us to come from a place of strength-based place and a place of love. Okay. You know, uh, we're running out of time, but I just want to get an answer sort of from everybody here. You know, so many times we uh, we see a disease or we see a manifest manifestation of something, but you know we miss the cut we sort of uh, we miss the symptoms of of what the problem is so many times trying to deal with the situation um, you know why is it that our community needs to focus on mental health issues now, and why is this such a crucial time for it well, probably the most important thing that I would say is that you can 't really be your best self all that God has called you to be or do unless you deal with your, with your issues because they keep you from being all that you can be. That's, that's what I think. It's like it's all the childhood wounds and scars that impact on us and so many of us never get help. And unless you're sitting there with somebody op opposite from you and you start talking, all of a sudden the tears start to flow. like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Sitting right here, right on our chests. Mm -hmm. So I think that's I'm a big advocate of going to see a therapist like yesterday. <laughs> well, just to jump in for one second, I know that you are a clinical person and you help people deal with things, but just watching this sort of cycle of the news on the loop and seeing people brutalized and then having to leave your home and whatever you're confronted with, is there something that we can just put in our pocket to get through the day or if you feel like you're at a point where I can't watch one more thing mm -hmm. or add another name to that list that you would say that we could do right now to build some kind of bridge to feeling better. Support each other. Um, I would say in our in our my groups or individual sessions, the first thing I do at the end of the group, I go, here's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. We're only here for an hour. Mm -hmm. The rest of the day, you got 23 hours to deal with the world as unfair as and cruel and unfair as it can be. So um, little different coping strategies. We work, we work with our young men on, okay, learning to kind of build upon their uh, emotional intelligence. So when they're able to identify uh, things beyond just anger, 
then it makes a little, increase the likelihood you'll make a better decision. So um, that's really what it is, really kind of expanding our, our, our emotional intelligence, our emotional experience, what our emotional experience really looks like. And then it's not guaranteed 100% because we can't, we can't guarantee what happens when you walk out, this, out there, whether you get stopped and frisked and what that could look like for you, or whether you get assaulted, or anything can happen to you in, the, mm -hmm. in New York City. But having, building up on that emotional intelligence for our young men to help them move forward in, in their experiences out there in New York. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would you. say that. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Please, final thoughts. Um, I would just say like it's time, y'all. Like um, from my perspective as a young person who's coming into adulthood and maturity, from as a Baltimorean originally, I have an understanding and a framework that this is a part of the war on drugs. And so we are 30 years into the war on drugs, and we're what I'm looking at in my peers and my counterparts. I'm starting to see the effects of that. People who are shell shocked. People who cannot get out of the bed each day in the morning, they want to go out to a protest, but because of the heavy police presence at the protest, they won't go. Because of mass shootings in Orlando, they won't go. Because of a declaration and an undeclared war on black and brown bodies, specifically other bodies, specifically the bodies of women and LGBTQ folks, um, we're seeing those effects where people are really immobilized and that energy that could be going to really creating innovative technology and solutions into the workforce, into the collective kind of healing practices, it's being wasted and being spent because people literally cannot get out of the bed because they're being flooded with images of black death and anti-blackness. So I just think it's about time for folks to really get together and start dancing and singing and getting some blues and some jazz and some soul on. And going back to the ancestors, those ancestral practices that held us together during similar times like this. Thank you so much for those words. Thank you all for being here. Sure. Um, Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me.